start the recording. All right. Are you taking the mic? Or shall I shall I take the mic? Um, well, um, welcome, yeah. welcome to Lit Bomb, everybody. We have a fantastic show for you today. Ray Armentrout, Leanne Brown, Rian Almakar, Scott, and Wang Ping. So we do have a fantastic show for you. Jonathan, you want to do the honors? Sure. <clears throat> Let's see here. So each week we are hosts read a oh, poem. No, wait a minute, Mark, 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 I believe you're introducing Jonathan? Yes, I am, but, but I'll, let, I'll let Jonathan have, have his word first. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, it's, it's fine. Um, yeah, each week um, we, uh, we host read a poem, and I usually read one that we've published on Unlikely Stories in the past week. Um, Unlikely Stories, this is the journal I run, which I'm sure Mark will tell you about, um, www.unlikelystories.org. This is called As a Data Point, and it's by Ken Pointer. As a Data Point. It has been determined by the best statisticians, by our best statisticians, that on average, a driver will have an accident every 42,000 driving miles. Around such, automobile insurance theory is based, incentives created, special rates bestowed, expectations traded, Morbidity and mortality paired to der I'm sorry, morbidity and mortality paired to derivations, discounts expired. I drive at 41,490 miles. I know there is a dark car behind me. I know at the intersection light camera, my vehicle shows on the monitors outlined in yellow, the current mileage updated in a small screen insert. I grip the wheel with both hands, but don't get me wrong. I am looking forward to the coming smash, to the car racing out of the unseen alley, the cyclist arching left from the right lane, the delivery truck that mistimes the three-way intersection light. I celebrate the inclusiveness of it. I want to do my part, to round out the numbers, make the balance sheet balance, the rate and discount schedules meet their maker's meanings. I want to be included, my feet on one pedal or the other, my spot on the graph earned. Thank you. Again, that's by Kim Pointer. Thank you, Jonathan. So, just to let you know a little bit about Jonathan. John, in 1998, Jonathan founded Unlikely Stories. Uh, and Unlikely Stories has been running as a continuously updated web magazine since then. Um, also, Unlikely spawned a daughter company, Unlikely Books. Uh, which publishes three to five poetry books per year. Um, Jonathan has lent editorial and management assistance to, to many literary and artistic ventures, but including uh, Mad Hat and the New Orleans Poetry Festival and Michael Rothenberg's Big Bridge. He's also organized literary performances across the United States in places uh, for, as far as from Alabama to Chihuahua, uh, from Georgia to Louisiana and New Mexico, New York City, uh, Ohio, Texas, and Washington State and DC. His poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press 2004, Blood and Salsa, and Painting Rust from Unli Unlikely Books in 2006, and Prosthetic Gods from New Sins Press, Wing City Chapbooks, Standards of Sedity from Litfest Press in 2016, and the free e chap from um what's his name the guy in liverpool jeffrey sides argotist ebooks uh, in 2017. um and next up we have larissa who jonathan is going to introduce all right larissa schmilo's new novel is sly bang from spite and dival her first novel is patient women from blaze Vox. Her poetry collections include Medusa's Country, Special Characters, In Paran, the wonderful chapbook, A Cure for Suicide, fantastic chapbook, and the ebook Fib Sequence, from, um, also from Jeffrey Side's Argotist eBooks, which you can download free. Her collection, Dora Laura, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry. Her poetry albums are The No Net World and Exorcism, for which she won the New Century Best Spoken Word Album Award. Her work has appeared in Plume, The Brooklyn Rail, Fulcrum, the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, 
the Journal of Poetics Research, Drunken Boat, Barrow Street, Gargoyle, and the anthologies Measure for Measure, an anthology of poetic meters from Penguin Random House, Words for the Wedding from Penguin, Contemporary Russian Poetry from Dalky, Resist Much, Obey Little, Poems for the Inauguration by Spoit and Dival, and Choice Words, Writers on Abortion by Haymarket, along with many others. She's the original Anglo English language translator of the first futurist opera, Victory Over the Sun, performed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Garage Museum of Moscow, the, Bur the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Theaters and Universities Worldwide. She also edited the anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry from Big Bitch Press and has been a translator on the Russian Bible for the Eugene A. Nida Institute for Biblical Scholarship. And you can see more about uh, her at our website, larissashmilo.com. Larissa, will you read a poem for us today? I would love to read a poem for you today. But before I do, I want to tell you about our upcoming shows, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to say the open mic list for today is full. So come back next week, please, and read for us then. We would love to hear you. Next week, we have a special translation panel. We have Helene Cardona, John Taylor, and Jennifer Kwan Dobbs reading their translations. And September 19th, we have our wide open open mic um, for 100,000 Poets for Change. Um, that list also is full, but stay tuned because someone might drop out and we could include you. So definitely come and come and support 100,000 Poets for Change, September 19th. We also are planning a series of fundraisers with some truly heavy hitting names, Erica Jung, just to name it one, um, October 10th. October 17th and October 24th, we are fundraising on the Zoomathon, the Lit Bomb Zoomathon. And we, we, we will be fundraising for the Democrats on, on those days. Please save the date, October 10th, October 17th, October 24th. And now, after all of that, I will read a poem, and it is called Quantum Love. The universe is hot expanding, immediate, and this explosion is a paradox, a particle and a wave, discrete and continuous, relative, absolute, and real. Time itself surrenders to the Big Bang. Space finds new dimensions and space-time curves like I do to your energy, to your gravity, to our new age of relativity and our energy and our mass and our energy times light are exponential, defying gravity, exploding creation, a unified field. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce my co-host, my brilliant co-host, Mark Vincennes, who is Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincent's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, The Three Taos of Tao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Sport and Devil. An album of music, ambience, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenz is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian, and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently, Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, which you can get from White Pine, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. About Vincenz's poetry, Cole Svensson has said, Vincenzo's poetry asks large and eternal questions and then deftly turns our attention to sharp details, the small ringing specifics that make up the concrete word. And Tony Hoagland has said, the ambitious poems of Mark Vincenzo don't fit into any poetic scene or aesthetic camp I can name. He is an internationalist and his work mixes far flung, far flung flavors, try to say that three times fast, far 
flung flavors. A little heart crane, a little Italo Convino, a little Pavesi, possibly Vallejo. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote, and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Witterbinner Foundation for Poetry. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the of my one of my uh, our, our wonderful press, Mad Hat Press, and publisher of New American Writing. He has lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the Peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Market uh, Mountain, uh, Greylock Mountain, and where there are more coyotes and bears than people. Everybody, this is Mark Vincennes. Take it away, Mark. The Seven Stories of the Seven Goddesses. One, alias. The world is intertwined with the unworld, said the old master. A true apprentice comes but once in a while. The measureless inconsistencies, the, the choking estuaries, the mind of an unbeing undoes all that has come before. What a glorious drifting river picture. Two, Avatar. What is the intertwining? he asked, bending over to pluck a flower. Such a puny recipe. The acts those limbs themselves make, we see it as our machine. The acts like thefts from human logic, the surface of the mind enscrolled, never spoken in good company. Three, alien, an illumination a clear sky or a cool breeze. Don't waste your breath collecting conch shells. No, you have all possible foreknowledge of the enigma, the engine of the poetry in good faith, or the pest that has marked us, the profile of the mountain, that inner surpassed tendency to flight. Four, agape. Hold up the mirror. No, you have all possible forms from the regal, sorry, from the eagle to the boar to hold you up. And if, in some strange fashion, the pressure of the eyes, the leisure of the face, the pummel of the sword, all become one thing, walk away with frost on your coat, I say. Five, alibi. The sound of the spider's webs, the cracking of the tiny eggs, even those kept in bottles in the center of the city where everyone has trained in the art of light. The unfolding of these minuscule creatures, the buzz and hum at the center of gravity perturbs. Six, a symmetry. Obviously everything starts with an A. In the storm, the earth worships the sky. In the flurry, the urge for second life, for an instrumental elemental fire to survive. Turn old kisses to new, like the sparks of carbon, all genders fetching toward the cannon curved out of paradise. Seven. And this is the seven of the seven stories of the seven goddesses. Assonance. Break the spell. Unworld the word. All this nonsense about an earthly paradise. The world remade in his image and all that. The fire within the eye or the eye within the fire. What is known is never written. Burn it. Burn it into the great appearance. Walk along. Mingle. Thank you.
And now we move to our feature. And we have some amazing poets reading for us tonight. Uh, Leanne Brown, Rion Amakar Scott, who is a short story and, and well, more a fiction writer, I believe. Uh, Wang Ping, who's published 14 books of poetry, and Ray Allen Trout, also 14 books of poetry, and very well known across the English language world for her beautiful, delicate, I would say minimalist poetry. Um, but we're going to start with Leanne Brown. Uh, Leanne Brown is a poet, performer, a curator, a teacher, a filmmaker, and an editor. Um, she is the author of five collections of poems and three collaborative artist books, uh, including Bagatelle for Cornell with uh, Karen Randall. Uh, her poetry collections include Other Archer, In the Laurels, Court, Crowns of Charlotte, The Sleep That Changed Everything, and her debut, um, the collection Polyverse, which, was, which came out from Sun and Moon Press. Um, her honors include the, the Acker Award, the Judith E. Wilson Poetry Fellowship at the University of Cambridge, the Fence Modern Poets Series Award, and the Howard Foundation Fellowship, a New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship and New American Poetry Series Award. As the founding editor of Tender Buttons Press, her work has been recognized by the Fund for Poetry, and, three, and, she's, and, and they have won three Firecracker Awards for their innovative publishing. Her poetry has been translated into French, Spanish, and Serbo-Croatian. Her writing has appeared in many anthologies, including I'll Drown My Book, Conceptual Writing by Women from Les Figues Press. She also teaches at St. John's University. Welcome, Leanne. We'd love to hear your work. Thank you. It's so great to see so many people from so many different parts of the world and from my life. And hi to everybody that I have not met as well. Um, thanks for inviting me, y'all. I appreciate it. Hope you can hear me all right. It's hot here. I'm in New York, and it's a little crazy feeling. I've been in the country for five months. And um, now I'm in New York City. It's making me a little anxious and angry, but I took a walk around the block and I think I'm feeling better. But <laughs> I'm going to read sonnets. Um, I'm going to try to read ones that you probably haven't heard before. I've been working on a book called Sonics, S-O-N-I-C-S. -S. And this is the prologue sonnet. Humans all come hear my song. I'm here to conjure figures form. Gather round me, hear me out. I'll tell you now what's come about. To the east, I cast erudition. To the south, I gather vines. To the west, I sense a vision. To the north, I gather time. The guts of mystery now spread out to us who are young, not lost, but found. We choose to live here, not in fear. Towers of Babel now crumble down. Amethyst rock in the climbing wall, borderless, or we all will fall. And here um, is sort of a translation of a Shakespeare sonnet, number 18. What do you think about becoming summer? No, you're even better, more balmy. <laughs> Those crazy storms do shake springs, buds, and global hot mouths contract runs out as we speak. Nowadays, the sun's a time bomb cinder in our eye. Too many times we find the foundation rubbed out as every equality swirls down the dreamer by chance operation or cell mutation uncut. Hell no. You'll never be lot less hot to me. You'll never lose your sudden shimmer aura. Death won't invite you to his shady party. All this radical divinity will resemble you. As long as we're not flooded out that long, this poem makes this baby pout. 
Love is strong as death, said the tower. Love is strong as death, said the tower, and I still don't know if it's true, not having not as yet died. Outrageous to think how we simultaneously, silently, and not so silently scream with those around the world when so many nearest and dearest humans, known and unknown, die. What can love do to hold them in memory's net, the nature of their death, a breath that changes all they are, ineffable into something unknown, a throne-like effect that will silence all of us in denial, yet despite the evidence of sense, the lists of the names of the dead are longer than your arm, much, much longer. Love's final dram of death to dream from which Love's final dram of death to dream from which we never wake and practice every night. The screen is only as big as a modern sonnet, like today's version of Kerouacian breast pocket ode. Guess it depends on your dream size as to how long your lines run. And as the roll of light is endless, we can pretend it just keeps going like a scroll. Volta on until we land and forget viscerally where we were last and start again to fend off debt and or trespass depending on the denomination of your bill's sphere up and down the net worth scale of a all appliances play so on to b we say if this plane went down no one would ever read this verse unless my rose gold box rose from ash like a tiny phoenix on the loose made briefly famous by its author's fiery demise and flaming aura in the future, people will want their 15 minutes of privacy rather than fame. So come over here again so we can be the same, lady, like, like Genesis and Lady J, as the world turns down its throbbing gristle. I hope these words will, as darting missile, pierce the fullness of all hearts who, having been warned by daily thumping, now remember joys of jumping, over hurdles, exit bumping. Dump that hump and play your ace. We are heading into space. And this is a, a sonnet that has found, thank you, found, um, found words from a visit to Charlotte, North Carolina, to a little town outside of Charlotte called Waxhaw, where my mother grew up. And um, yes, yeah, Shakespeare in Outer Space. Thank you, Jeff Wright. It's great to see all so many people. Oh my god. Outer music. It's got quotes from this man named Haskell Ergel. He, he's featured in the poem. Quote, Fuchsia Clayton could tap dance on one foot, exclaimed Haskell Ergel, and later that his brother, Louis, saw Sweet Bird of Youth with Geraldine Page and Paul Newman and had said, Quote, I can't decide which one I love more. A big buck beer was right outside the back window. And at lunch, I learned, quote, Miss Pearl Rodman bought a very expensive machine that would turn the pages of her Bible. What happened to that youngish woman I met a few years back when we read poems at the museum, I inquired. Dawn, oh, she was the mayor. She broke bad, Haskell said. She does not make a picture. Okay. I meant to turn my timer on. Okay. I have two more. Swimmer sonnet. This is uh, Shakespeare's number 80, translated. Oh, how I swoon when I try to write about you. Even though I know you go with somebody else who is a fluent writer, now focused on your culture. Major writer's block when thinking of your glamour. But since your glow is wider than the sea in which you swam as Venus, I too can sail my saucy raft so much smaller than his. Since semaphore as you seem to swim towards me, your smallest gesture sends courage signals free. While my competition captain I'm wrecked, though. No way to rescue thee in good standing with all around the town. He gets ahead, and I'm done for. Worst case scenario, exquisite suffering, exquisite corpse. 
and this is Sonnet 81, one of us will die inside these arms. One will spread our ashes round the yard. How unlikely we'll both die at the same moment, though it's been known to happen. So investing in your future by writing these poems, no wonder I'm having trouble finishing this book. I want to do it right. But trust me, these minute particulars and rhythm embedded will sing your presence to censors, not yet a light in parents' eyes. You'll live on. Don't worry. I'll figure out a way to do ahead. The readers of this world are dead. Thank you, Leanne. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to read the last one. Yeah, my, it said it was unstable, so I paused. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to read two more. Sorry. Train ride. This is with Julie Patton. On a tra train from it's the Silver Crescent from Birmingham to Charlotte, North Carolina, April 2019. Nick said footage from a train is never anything more than footage shot from a train. But I say poetry, on the other hand, can be something else. Hallucinogenic, silent speed. What's your name? Pudding and tame. Tunnels of green optical frame. Two, three, no, four eagles and tanks guarding solar panels. Goats and a green silo. How long has it been um, talk of the sexiest poets made me have bad dreams. We just passed the time zone line into Georgia, red clay surveillance state. I never want to eat again. I wish I were more sane. Deep woods off. And a sliding door Twitter phone beamed in. Alexander Pope wore a corset. Couplet as corset. And I'll just read the epilogue sonnet. Humans I hope you'll forgive me. I've got to fly to a solitary party of my own, very new and individual mind. But if you've gained some gain from this night's art of how to be slow or a little more kind, I will have done my thing as bridge builder, not destroyer, being cure, not quick fixer upper. And I'm in this circle with so many others. Quilters of cover against the pot boiler. Be architect of each other's dream, because now or never our futures stream. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, when did you when did you move back from Asheville to New York City recently? About two days ago. Yeah. How did, how did that go? I don't know. It's still going. <laughs> it's it's very hot here. <laughs> it's hotter than in North Carolina. Is it really? Is it? We, we've, we've already gotten cool here up in the Berkshires. But next up, we have Rion Amelkar Scott, who is the author of the story collection, The World Doesn't Require You, from Norton. A finalist for the Penn Gene Stein Book Award, his debut story collection, Insurrections from the University of Kentucky Press, 2016, was awarded the Penn Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction and the 2017 Hillsdale Award from the Fellowship of Southern Writers. His work has been published in such journals and magazines as The New Yorker, The Kenyan Review, Crab Orchard Review, and The Rumpus. Uh, one of his stories was listed as a notable in the Best American Stories 2018. And one of his essays was listed in, as a notable in the uh, Best American Essays 2015. He was raised in Silver Spring, Maryland, and earned an MFA from George Mason University, where he won the Mary Roberts Reinhardt Award, a com completion fellowship, and an, an alumni exemplar award. He has received fellowships from Breadloaf Writing Conference from Kimbillo and the Colgate Writing Conference, as well as a 2019 Maryland Individual Artist Award. At the moment, he teaches creative writing at the University of Maryland. Welcome, Rion. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, I'm excited 
to read it for un unlikely. So they're the first people to, to publish me. First time anyone ever published me was in uh, Unlikely Story. So um, it's actually incredible to be here. Um, well, not here in this house, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, here, okay, in, so I'm, here in our house, maybe, right? Um, so I guess I'm in everyone's house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read uh, two, two tiny stories from my, from my collection, The World Doesn't Require You. Um, all these stories take place in this fictional town called Cross River, Maryland. This one um, is called On the Occasion of the Death of Freddie Lee. Uh, I don't know if you recall, um, several years ago uh, in, in Baltimore, um, not, too, not too far, but a little ways off from, from, where, from where I live, uh, a man named Freddie Gray was, uh, was murdered by the police. And, um, you know, they put him in the back of a van and they drove all recklessly and they severed his, severed his neck. And then there was a, an, an uprising afterwards. Um, this story was originally written for a, a, a art exhibit called Call and Response. And the first meeting was like right after that happened. Um, and uh, Call and Response is, you know, they had an artist um, an artist react to uh, a writer's work, and this year they brought in food, and so they, uh, you know, it was it was so close to, to to the uprising, to the end of the uprising. I thought it would be canceled. The the the, the meeting would be canceled, um, but um, it wasn't. And uh, the food that we ate, you know, I was supposed to react to the food too. And the writing was like this, uh, this like rice with beef in it, and had this smoky taste. So I felt like the universe was calling me to write something incendiary to say fuck the police. Um, it, it didn't turn out to that way, but um, it, it turned out to be what it is, and that's and, and that's fine. Uh, I'm sure I'll have many many uh, occasions in the future to say fuck the police. Um, but um, th this story um, was uh, sort of came out of came out of all that um, all that, that that chaos and that that moment of the uh, of the food tasting on the early morning in the turgid musty swamp. Freddie Lee collapsed amongst the rice in the brown water, a result of working his body like a machine. Both John Henry, the steel driving man, and the locomotive at the same time. He so loved the work, he battled himself to fill basket after basket with rice stalks. And as a reward, he fell face down into the crops before any of us woke. We all labored next to his body as we were told to do, coming to view his dead form with a reverence. Freddie was no longer a man, no longer our friend, but instead an offering to God, made to lie out there until Papa Troy gave word. And each night we burned the stalks we picked from around him. But something kept getting to me out in the sun, something beyond the stench, something that rearranged my mind. Man, every time I drew near to the eternally slumbering Freddie Lee and his decaying face. I remember when Mama Yona died, and we and DVDs away from it all at this rice farm in the ruins of a plantation on a wilderness hill. The children planted a tree over her resting place and it felt beautiful and unreal as if we existed on a spinning disc covered by a magical dome. Anything could happen here. Freddie Lee believed in this life with the entirety of his, unbeknownst to him, dying heart. Working the watery fields after my friend passed, I didn't become deranged, but found, myself, but found myself somewhere close to it. Something resembling a dark shadow spreading like an inkblot over my brain. I had obeyed dutifully, following after Freddie Lee. I wondered if I'd share his fate, lying among the rice in the muck with a crumbling forever stare. And I could have probably taken it, inky brain and all, had I not seen that blasted cow, Lanier, tearing at Freddie Lee's face, ripping, chewing his fresh like, chewing his flesh like fresh grass. I waved my arms and yelled, charged the beast while screaming, but her tail swatted at flies, and the rest of the animal paid me no mind. The chewed face of Freddie, Papa Troy told us, is just how it's supposed to be. Me and Luke and little Uni went out that night to move the body from the shallow waters, but Mama's thug riders, that's what they called themselves, rode in silently on their horses. At least I didn't hear them. 
and wave their whips at us, opening up raw wounds on our chests and our backs. When we returned to our cabin, we listened to the breeze whistle through the cracks, and we tended to each other's wounds. I watched the great house with its light and its mirth. I was sure the drinks flowed there like, river, like the river water we diverted over the land to feed the rice stalks. Papa was having a party. There was always a party, and we were there eternally uninvited unless someone important wanted a piece of our souls. Papa says everyone is equal, Luke said. Some people are shh, little Yumi said, kissing his lips. I watched them make love. They soon crumpled to the floor, exhausted and sated as they were taught to be. Did you see Freddie Lee's body, I asked? John Henry, the rice harvesting man? If he died harvesting rice for the love of us all, then why, even before that cow, even before that damn cow got to him, was he all broken and bruised? Shh, little Uni said, but she had no energy to save me. And before I could ask about the expelled, whether our friend was close to them, as the whispers implied, we all fell one by one into, into dazed and dizzying fever dreams. I wonder who was the first to speak of the flames in our sleep murmurs. Did we all share the same nightmares? Morning came, the sun rose hot over the damp fields, and we are once again the docile supplicants of Mama Yona and Papa Troy's mercy, picking rice around our friend, poor Freddie Lee, his, his face skeletal except those swollen staring eyes. He deserved more than the tepid love of cowards. It might have ended right there had Freddie Lee not risen from the dead to rip that cow into thousands of pieces. That morning, Papa had planned to announce his next queen. Could have been any of us, but we woke to bits of bloody cow meat everywhere, smeared on the windows of the great house, clinging to the rice stalks. Papa postponed his announcement and called for us to give up any information we had on the whereabouts of Freddie Lee's body and the circumstances of the cow's death. Someone pointed their fingers at the three of us, but we pointed ours right back. If it were us, I said, wouldn't we be stained, marked like we took a bath in cow's blood? My logic silenced our accusers. For three hours, Papa Troy stood on the porch of the great house, discussing betrayal and the life of his beloved Lanier. Tears soaked into his beard, his voice as watery as the rice fields. Our hearts broke, but who are we to ramble madly about what we knew, what we saw? The dead man sauntering smoothly, coolly, until he spotted the cow. He stopped and threw his head back, wailing silently. The cow had long ripped his tongue from his mouth, his raw face and his perfect eyes bathed in the light of the moon. I called his name, but he watched us as if we were merely curiosities to ponder and then ignore. He stared for several seconds before he did his violence. I stayed up many nights afterward to catch a glimpse of Freddie Lee, but I never saw him again. Every once in a while, I'd ask Luke or little Uni if we saw what we really saw, and they'd nod like walking corpses without tongues. One evening, when the passing of the months had given us no ease from the thug riders and their whippings, little Uni and I stood near the farthest edge of the farm. Did we really see what we saw? I asked again. You know, with Freddie. Shh, she said. Shh. She pointed to Luke walking toward us a bundle of stalks in his arms. Behind him, flames had begun dancing along the fields. Fires even tap danced upon the face of the waters below. The only world we knew was now shrouded in clouds of black smoke. I watched Luke's rice and breathed in his fumes. He stank of gasoline. Little Uni sighed. Luke cursed, dumped the day's haul to the wet ground. Little Uni lit a match. Okay, that was on the occasion of the death of Freddie Lee. Um, I'm going to read another story. It's very, very, another, another very short one. This one is called uh, A Loudness of Screechers. The first of the screecher birds appeared like, that year like a hero in the sky. I hated these cold walks home from the bus stop. Oh, this is, this is narrated by a 16-year-old girl, so please suspend your disbelief. 
Uh, let me start over. The first of the screecher birds appeared that year like a hero in the sky. I hated these cold walks home from the bus stop. Josh had grabbed my butt and dashed off as a deer. He looked back with a dumb smile just as the impressive thing was coasting overhead. Massive wings spread wide. Niggas childish as shit, said Andrew, the boy who dared Josh, as he sidled up next to me, too close. His breath smelled of peppermint, cigarettes, and tooth decay. I breathed deeply, hoping the air would freeze and then crack my heart. One more week until Christmas break. Josh and Andrew wouldn't be in my face every day, and I could ignore them more easily. Just ignoring them is what my mother would advise anyway. Daddy would tell me to punch them in their heads. That's far too angry. My Uncle Charles would smile, would say, smile, and don't let them dumb niggas see you sweat. Go somewhere before I call that screecher down to snatch y'all, I said. There was a smile on my face that poisoned my words, made them sound joyful. Josh mumbled something about the birds never straying so far from the wildlands while I looked up at the claws of the circling thing and imagined it swooping down and snatching the boys, piercing their chests with sharp, with, with sharp talons, digging into their guts, pulling out their intestines to gobble them like early birds gobble worms from the dirt. Just before Christmas, the sky turned black with a loudness of screeches flying in impossible patterns. Cracks of light peeked through their ragged feathers. Their wingspans took our breath from us, my little brothers and me. And we pointed and oohed by the window. Every so often the birds would flap their impressive wings and we wondered how they stayed up there with so little effort. Both day and night, the, ha the bawling from the sky left us awake and red-eyed. Some called the birds cry cries because of their anguished wails, but screechers always sounded truer than me. Mahad and Jamal ran about flapping and squawking until Umi told them to shut their mouths. This is not the joke you think it is, she said. My father, my uncle, and about six or seven important men sat in my dad's study, talking real quiet. Josh's dad was there, as was Andrew's mother, the only woman in the bunch. From time to time, they raised their voices in anger, but it will always settle back to a low grumble. Do them like the wolves, a voice, not my father said. Bang, bang, do them like the wolves. Sarai, my mother called. Take your brothers downstairs, please. It wasn't at all fair of Umi to tell me to wrangle two curious five-year-olds. Seems to me now that was her job. But I didn't complain back then. I said, okay, you little rats. You heard Umi, downstairs. The little rats ran about one clockwise, the other counter, squawking, 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 saliva running down their chins. My father stepped from the room, looking taller than usual, his face disturbed and heavy. I froze, grabbed the fleeing Jamal as he dashed by and pulled him close. I'd seen this face on my father before and a beating usually followed. He called our names and knelt so he was eye level with my brothers. He pulled us all in, hugging us too tight. The boys squirmed. My back hurt, but I didn't fight. Daddy pressed his face to my stomach. I felt the wetness of his tears soaking my shirt. I love you all, and your mother loves you all, and your Uncle Charles does too, he said. My uncle walked by, a silver platter in his hands. Atop it, the charred wolf that was to be our holiday centerpiece. Charlie, my father called, but my uncle didn't look back as he moved swiftly out the door. We watched by the window as Uncle Charles bowed before the flying birds in an exaggerated gesture of respect. The important men mumbled among themselves while my parents watched stoically. And when my father could take no more, he turned and shambled away. One of those big black things landed in front of my uncle. With his beak, the bird knocked the wolf from the platter and stared down at Uncle Charles with a condescending glare. Good Lord, Josh's dad said, the offering. It screeched in Uncle Charles's face, a sound like 12 air raid sirens. I could feel the sound vibrating at my feet. My uncle was surely now deaf, his eardrums ruptured. Another bird landed and let out more screeching. The two birds rose above his head beating their wings into one another. 
pecking at feathers and flesh. My uncle raised his arms in protection. My father burst into the room, shotgun in hand. No, Andrew's mother called. This is the ritual. Fuck the ritual, my father cried. That's my only brother. Some of the important men screamed and snatched at him. He held firm to his weapon, swinging it all about. I'll shoot, he called, I'll shoot. My brothers clung tight to my legs, tears staining their cheeks and shirts. I assured them things would be fine, but my wet face was no better than theirs. Reynold, my mother said finally. Reynold, this is the ritual. He held his gun at her, the only thing between him and the door. But the tension had broken. We all knew my father couldn't shoot my mother. This is the ritual, she repeated. Fuck the ritual, my father said, lowering the gun, tears in his eyes. That's my little brother. By then, one screecher lay dead, and the other had snatched Uncle Charles, talons piercing his sides, blood dripping to the streets. He flopped about like a doll in that bird's embrace, climbing higher and higher into the sky. The layer of screechers that blocked the blue cleared, first slowly, and then all at once. The loudness flew off, leaving nothing but bird shit and air splitting whales in its wake. For the first time in weeks, we could see the turquoise, and we could see the sun, and now all I felt for them was a fierce hatred. Thank you. Thank you, Rian. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Wong Ping, or Ping Wong. Some of you probably don't know that the Chinese name is actually normally the, fir the surname first, or the last name first. Um, so Wong Ping is what, what Wong Ping would be called in China, but, but Ping is actually her first name, correct? You there, Ping? We got you unmuted? No. Let's try. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Yes, thank you, uh, Mark. Um, but I, I still have to, to, to tell the rest of your bio. Um, uh, Wang Ping has published 14 books of poetry and prose, including most recently, My Name is Immigrant, um, Life of Miracles along, along the Yangtze and Mississippi, American Visa, Foreign Devil, of Flesh and Spirit, Aching for Beauty, The Magic Whip, Last Communist Virgin. She is the recipient of an NEA, Bush, Lannan, and McKnight Fellowships, uh, director of Kinship of Rivers Project, which you may have seen online uh, with the flags that, um, that uh, Ping raises all over the world um, in solidarity of, of, of human life and, uh, and, and nature. Um, she's also a professor of English at McAllister College, uh, a dancer, photographer, and installation artist. Her multimedia exhibitions include uh, Behind the Gate After the Flood of the Three Gorges, We Are Water, Kinship of Rivers at Colleges, Galleries, Museums, River Confluences, and Mountains Around the World. Thank you so much for joining us, Ping. Thank you. It's great. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to meet you. And I have never met so many friends online like this. That's really amazing. I love this. So I'm going to read um, a few poems from My Name is Immigrant, this book, and, uh, and then I will read a new poem. Uh, just cheer things up. This book is a little bit somber because it's all the stories of immigrants. And uh, yeah, the first short poem, uh, no, the first poem I will read is um, called Things We Carry on the Sea. We carry tears in our eyes. Goodbye, father. Goodbye, mother. We carry soil in small bags. May home never fade from our hearts. We carry names, stories, memories of our village, civilization. We carry scars from proxy wars of greed. We carry carnage of mining, droughts, floods, genocides. We carry dust of our families incinerated in mushroom clouds. We carry our islands sinking under the sea. 
we carry our hands, feet, bones, hearts, and best minds to start a new life. We carry diploma, medicine, engineer, nurse, education, math, poetry, even if they mean nothing to the other shore. We carry railroads, plantations, laundromats, taco trucks, farms, factories, nursing homes, schools, temples, all built on our ancestors' backs. We carry old homes along the spine, new dreams in our chests. We carry yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We are orphans of the wars forced upon us. We are refugees of the sea, drowning in plastic wastes. We came from the same mother in Africa. We are your children, sisters and brothers, fathers and mothers. Our tongues carry the same weight as we chant. I, hub, lib, armor, amor, love, ping an, salam, shalom, pass, peace, xi wang, amal, hafnan, esperanza, hope, 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 as we drift from dream to dream. See to see. And I will read a short poem um, from this long, um, um, a big series of poems called The Cockle Pickers, about 32 Chinese immigrants um, died picking cockles uh, at Morecambe Bay in, near London a few years ago. And um, they died live because nobody could it was pitch dark and nobody could uh, go out um, to rescue them, but they could hear them crying for help and saying goodbye to their families in China as the tides came up to their nose and submerged them. And uh, let me read this one. Oh, uh, it's part Chinese and part English and this Chinese. Oh shoot! I can't reach my. How do I get to my? Okay, got it. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, this Chinese, uh, Chinese, we have uh, the tradition of staying home with parents forever, never leave home, and also this tradition of sailing off the sea. And um, we have over 5,000 years of sailing, actually. And uh, there are a lot of books, um, Shan Hai Jing, Mount, um, the scripture of mountains and rivers, have very detailed uh, stories uh, that prove that Chinese have traveled all, all around the world, all the way to the south, to Mexico, actually. And uh, Fu Shang, that kind of tree is described actually was uh, the, the big, big, like the big, uh, uh, like Capcus that I recently saw in Arizona. So it's really amazing to see the plan described 5,000 years ago in the books, you know, and uh, yeah. So, so I'm trying to explore why those people like including myself, travel so much while always looking at home, longing to go back, right, this contradiction. And then until I actually started learning, you know, um, I spent nine years to study uh, Chinese medicine and half of the courses are uh, Western medicine. And my most interest is actually uh, in cells and uh, neuroscience and the brain. And it hit me one day that life actually from the cell, the basic unit of life begins with migration, with immigration. And uh, the cell itself is made of two walls, the two membranes, and um, they have to cross the borders all the time, right? They have to cross the walls, the membranes to exchange life and waste. And once the migration stops, life 
ends, death begins, right? So it hits me that, oh, I'm part of this biology. I'm part of this life migration and the movement. And I really should not feel ashamed. I should feel very proud, you know? And um, so here's this one poem for one of the 32 um, uh, victims who drowned. Cockle pickers, Wang Xiuyu, Zhang Xiuhua, Fu Mu Zai, Bu Yuan Yu, Fu Mu Zai, Bu Yuan Yu. When fathers and mothers still live, children do not wander far off. Tread sands with care, in each tangled grain, a soul. Tread waves with care. In each foaming mouth, a word. Tread words with care. In each howling sound, a ghost. So the next is a little um, story that when Ai Weiwei, um, the Chinese artist, um, he's quite famous. Um, we were really good friends uh, when he was living in the East Coast, uh, uh, East Village, uh, New York. And um, so here's a story about to say goodbye to him. It's the last day in New York. It's called My Name's Immigrant. Ai Weiwei is going home. I ask him what he wants to eat for the farewell party. Dumplings. Plain old dumplings, pork and cabbage, he says. Many people come, all Chinese, poet laureates, master artists, composers, conductors, professors from Taiwan, Hong Kong, mainland China. It takes forever to introduce ourselves. When I talk about new book, Yu cuts in. I hope writers and filmmakers will stop presenting Chinese and China in such dark, evil images especially to foreigners. Don't forget, we have 5,000 years of civilization. What do they have? Maybe a few hundred years, unless they count the Native Americans? We should never lose our pride. Song shouts, but look at us. We're all supposed to be Renjian, the cream of this 5,000 year old civilization. Yet it is the land with a few hundred years of history that gives us a place to live. No one speaks. We all have tears in our eyes. Wei Wei sits alone by the window, twirling a dumpling skin on his fingertips. I grabbed it from his hand, flip it out of the 16th floor, sit down and hold his hand. Are you all packed? He nods. Do you have to go back? He nods. His father is gravely ill, growing up, Wei Wei had a feisty relationship with his dad, who would smack him with bricks and laundry bags, hoping to beat some obedience into his rebellious spirit. We had quite good laughs together as we exchanged our stories. Now the old man wants his youngest child at his bedside as he lies dying in Beijing. Did your father get his old home back? Wei Wei shakes his head, then nods, then shakes again. His father is China's most famous poet. During the Cultural Revolution, the whole family was exiled to the countryside. They lost everything, including their house, an old style Si He Yuan. They have been trying to get it back. Where is he going to live in Beijing? When are you coming back to New York? I want to ask, but remain silent. Will he retain, return to the city again? He's been living here for years and has a green card granted to him as a distinguished artist. The city has been his home. Is it really? I remember his basement in the East Village, the moldy rings on his shower curtain and the linoleum tiles, his artwork strewn around, covered with spider webs, his roommate Xu Bing, another renowned, renowned artist from China, pale and starved looking, Song and Yu are still arguing back and forth if we were, if we are better off back home or in exile, and why we can't feel home where we live, why we forever feel exiled and homeless. 
Now my mind goes back to Song's studio in Brooklyn, his entire place covered with thirty years of dust, droppings from roaches and rats. Yet in this grave home, he makes hundreds of rows of calligraphy, paintings, poems, all breathtakingly beautiful, all kept in mint condition. That's when the revolution revelation hits me. It doesn't matter where we live, what they call us. Pink, pin, pig, chink, stupid, ignorant, low IQ, China doll, lazy bum, job thief, worst of the worst, never good enough. Go back to where you are from. What matters is how we call ourselves, with the joy and pride of coming home, 回家 circling home, as a migrant, as a bird, a fish, a butterfly, a tree, a weed, an immigrant. As the first man who walked out of Africa and arrived in South China, who became my Chinese ancestors, carrying home on their back in our heart, I'm Wang Ping, I'm immigrant, drifting from the Turtle Island, till I become Mino Guizi Gu Kui, Good Sky Woman. Immigrant is my name, our name, and it's a good name. What the fuck? Someone shouts from the street. The dumpling skin had just landed. We laugh. Ai Weiwei squeezes my hand. There's light in his eyes and a smile on his lips. It's not his usual mischievous smile when we've done something wicked, but a knowing smile. The same revelation has reached him too. I hate letters, but I'll write to you from Beijing. Let's keep in touch, Ping. We hug. Our hearts meet, then settle in a magic place where there is no exile, where home resides in the stillness, while everything is in constant motion. We know how lucky we are, still alive after such turmoil. We know each we know each survival is a miracle. We know our miracle is backed by thousands of unfulfilled dreams. The dead are never dead; they live through us. They sing their stories through our mouths, our hands, and we have work to do. I know he wants to keep in touch through living, free, fierce, fearless, and we have kept our promise. So I will read、uh, one.、Um, Poem, thank you. And I will read the one poem、um, for the, my next manuscript. It's called "The River in Our Blood," and、uh, it's called "Biography of Green and Edible Sonnet Hazal," and it's fourteen lines and in the Hazal form. And、um, I'm just in love with green, and I did some research, and、uh, I found some amazing. Things, the scientific things about green, and、uh, it is really the color of life. So here it is. With fiddle hands, I fold and unfold light, painting air with emerald green, turning CO two into sugar plus O, till I drape Mother Earth with twenty four shades of green. This planet was born in a ball of fire, then basalt, then granite, then glacial ice. With slate of hand, I pickled her into lime, sage, basil, pear, pear, and apple green. I tap, clap, spin, whisper, sway with willows. My juniper veins open to the sun. My moss blood running towards roots, and life stings with parakeet. Green. A week, a awakened from Arctic dreams, I chase grassland and forests with seaweed tendrils, a linchpin between sky and earth. My wavelengths designed for spruce mint green, spectrum between blue and yellow, Rosetta stone for fern, shamrock, sea foam, sitting in the middle. Of the rainbow wheel, I open seasons with chartreuse mustard green. In China, there's no difference between blue and green. 
Qing Chu Yu Lan, Er Sheng Yu Lan. Green equals chlorophyll equals green leaf equals photosynthesis equals oxygen equals glucose equals pear equals pine equals ocean green. A cycle without beginning or end, my sapphire waves shimmering, lighting up first word, smell, taste, sound, touch, till earth hangs on the twig of olive green. Count needles on cypress, count clapping hands on aspen trees, count trees on earth. Behold earth in my palms of a hundred twenty quadrillion leaves, a panthalassa of pistachio green. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really fun. Good thing. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. Next up, we have Ray Armantrout, who is the author of 14 books of poems as well as Ping, um, including Conjecture from Wesleyan, Wobble, a, fi a finalist for the National Book Award, partly in New Unselected Poems in 2016, and Versed 2009, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Books Critics Circle Award in 2010. Her work has appeared in many anthologies, a journal and journals including Lana Turner Baum, Baum, The New Yorker. She is a professor emerita at UC San Diego. We're delighted to have you tonight. Okay. okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to start by reading from my new book, Conjure. I love this cover with a rabbit made of twigs. And then I'll read a few newer poems. Pinocchio. Friend. In this dream, the paths cross and cross again. They are spelling a real boy out of repetition. Each one is the one real boy. Each knows he must be wrong about this but he can't feel how the fish and the fisherman the pilot the princess the fireman and the ones on fire speculative fiction the idea that producing a string of nonsense syllables while pointing toward an object is common in children on the verge of language. The idea that force exists only as an interaction between objects, while an object is a kind of kink in a force field. The idea that if one survives X number of years, one will live to see how things turn out, or even that things end well. In the future, we will face new problems. How will we represent the variety of human types once all the large animals are gone? As sly as a mother, as hungry as an orphan? Guises, I come up again and again, as if from the ground, as if in a dream, see that I'm naked and cover myself in a likeness, O oh Lord, iconic, as if a pebble could speak for a cave about desire from a mile off. Natural histories. Since the irrational, because I said so, start, they'd had their differences. Color that isn't really color, spin that isn't spin, because attitudes best when it has no content. Ask a physicist what charge is, 
he'll say your question makes no sense. Word had it that if they surrendered their feckless ways and their lives with no end, if they joined up, they would get ahead, something to speak for them. The head says, I don't want to die, says, I am all alone here. Notice, the way a gesture used to ward off trouble became cheerful waving. There was so much looming and banishing to take note of always. We felt like play actors before we knew what we were about and after. Turns out the mummy's curse is real. You pump thick death out of the ground and burn it, it kills you. But in all the movies, curses are a cheap plot trick. The doofus who can't read the hieroglyph dies first, and no one misses him. Them. We were born yesterday. We're sorry. Where will you spend eternity? How would you describe a god who could use magic but doesn't? Who prefers elaborate widgets and toggles? Seconds toppling one by one, the careful recording of endless instructions. We're riveted by the hell show. The devil plays a huckster. What will he come out with next? Demons banished for dramatic effect are brought back to lobby for poisoning children. We can't believe they let us watch. In fact, they make us. Beautiful, right? Nope, oh, I'm not finished. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> okay. Care. Dress like you care. Eat like you care. Care like you care. You don't think apples just grow on trees, do you? A fish taps a clam against a bony knob of coral to crack its shell, which demonstrates intelligence, yes, but is the fish pleased with itself? Alone in your crib, you form syllables are you happy when one is like another? Add yourself to yourself. Now you have someone. None such. This eucalyptus with its elliptical leaves dangling light and dry as an abandoned chrysalis with its modest bunches of pale pink flowers and languid pose is my unattainable ideal. Of a piece, in pieces, past it all and in plain view, nowhere in the blasted web of stars is there any such beauty. Preview. There are worldwide catastrophic storms when Earth's network of weather control satellites is sabotaged by unknown enemies. As fire rages through the western forest, Jeff Bridges snarls, if you want a piece of me, come get me. The baby says, mmm, mmm, to the stuffed fish, then hits it against her closed mouth. Ah, ah, she says, holding it at a distance. She opens and closes the palm of one hand. Bye-bye, we say for her. Bye-bye, fishy. All right, now I'm gonna read a few new poems. Hang on. Domestic as an empty shopping cart parked on a ledge above a freeway. Artifactual as an acorn barnacle, 
What is the purpose of barnacles? People ask the internet. Barnacles are filter feeders. They're fish tank decor. A plaque of barnacles on top of a toilet. This cluster of brittle puckers clinging to its old idea. These craters striped pale lavender for some unlikely eye. On growth, dressed all in plastic, which means oil, we're bright-eyed, scrambling for the colored cubes spilled on the rug's polymer. Inside each is a tiny car. When we can't unscrew the tops, we cry for help. We're optimists. To sleep is to fall into belief. Airing even our worst suspicions may be pleasurable. We are carried, buoyed. In sleep, the body can heal itself, grow larger. Creatures that never wake can sprout a whole new limb, a tail. This may be wrong. How to disappear. You had been swinging restlessly between the appearance of spontaneity and the appearance of serious thought. You had been changing lanes after a glance in a mirror honest about its tendency to distort. What choice did you have? It was soothing to watch wisps of smoke from a nearby chimney disappearing one by one. Do you like pulses, ridges, ripples, stretching into obscurity? Would you prefer a flicker to a steady light source? This one stutters slightly, hesitant, as if it could hold something in reserve. The sleep problem. If there's anything I can do to help me, I said, that's not what I meant. I must hold my intention in my mind's eye or it will go astray. I must remember to intend to hold it tenderly. Kickity doodah, I say, when you flop over in bed, thrashing, meaning zippity brew ha ha, in a language I keep forgetting you don't speak. A sentence begins and ends in the present, but on the way, we need to hurry. Zippity Doodah is a slave song commissioned by Walt Disney. Elmer Fudd aims his blunderbuss, his boundless abstract rage. Startle reflex. Ford's robo dogs roam the factory floor and enjoy a good belly rub. People are startled to discover that their inner monologues are ghost written. A sentence that once made sense and now does not appears haunted. Experts are surprised to learn sparrows across North America have changed their tune. Let's just make it to the end. Everyone's riveted by the shock of the disaster victims, the way they search for words. Gone. This little begonia is fierce enough to matter, to have a bearing on, to press a point, and to be of some concern. This music gently shakes itself as if it had forgotten something. Then it goes nowhere urgently. It settles here and there to repeat a motif like a bee visiting flowers. It winds concerns on a spindle. To hear it is to have a mother retrospectively. Okay, three more, I think. Password. 
as if the problem were that I couldn't stuff the bulky text into the child's backpack and was late for a class I never registered for so long ago. Business tiptoes in a world of masks. People relate to a transparent sham as if genre weren't camo. Strange to wake rested after these dreams of disaster and scandal not registered as such. When I've stared long enough at the rough skinned, snub nosed or tough nippled lemons, I will give attention to World Password Day. Tell it to the judge. I admit I skipped 16 relatable moments. When the flurry of wind chime stops, I listen. I write closing dimples of sweetness. When another human speaks, I turn away. I admit I confuse eternity with equivocation and that I do it on purpose as the leaves nod and shake. This will be the last one. Split. There are pockets of apocalypse, invaginations, don't wince. I know you've always appreciated correspondence, the dormant stage of contagion. Some say truth is a form of parasitism. It is what it is, distal and proximal have split down the mid rib of a leaf. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Ryan. Down the mid leaf <laughs> of a rift. Um, so I'm now going to hand it over to Larissa. Thank you so much, our, our, our featured authors tonight. This was an amazing show. Um, including Leanne Brown, Rion Amakar Scott, um, Wong Ping, and Ray. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading. And over to Larissa. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, please, for that fantastic reading. Um, a, a hand, please, for Wang, Wang Ping, Ron Amakar Scott, Leanne Brown, and Ray Armantrat. Thank you so much for a brilliant reading, everybody. Thank you. I would like to invite you next week, September 12th, um, also live at five, we have a translation panel with John Taylor. Um, Helene- John, John Taylor live from, from the south of France, by the way. Oh, John Taylor live from the south of France, even better. Um, um, we have um, Helene Cardona and Jennifer Quan Dobbs. So that should be exciting. And we have 100,000 Poets for Change, September 19th, the open mic, which is now full, but come in case somebody bombs out. And we would love to see you there. Um, set aside the dates, please set aside the dates, October 10th, October 17th, and October 24th. For the Lit Bomb Zoomathon, we are going to be raising money for the Democrats and and hopefully raising consciousness for the vote. We have some superstars planning um, to read. It will be a no holds barred, barred poetry reading. Do not miss it, October 10th, October 17th, October 24th. Now let's go on to our open mic and bring on first, we'd like to bring on Ben Mazur, who has a new book. Can we unmute Ben? Yes. Hello, yes. Ben. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Um, well, I have a new book of poems out from Mad Hat Press, and it's called The Hierarchy of the Pavilions. And if you go to the Mad Hat Press website, you can order a copy now. Um, I'll read the title poem from the collection, um, which is, the, t the collection is called The Hierarchy of the Pavilions, Pavilions Plural, but the title poem is The Hierarchy of the Pavilion, Pavilion Singular. And so I will read The Hierarchy of the Pavilion. 
the hierarchy of the pavilion. Socrates anent the living pool, TV atrocities and panther deities composed this little earth-laden sun gleam ditty. At close of day, the brink of flagmanship stride solemn as the office commendates to be. Yet hurdle purple mendicates of cusps, late Christmas eves, the meltdowns of the stores, mid brass and brick and stone, New England time of her surmise, the pearly corpses of in the outer vineyards. There's a signal for language of not feeling well, party colored by the great comedians of the past, but in the doing, in an economy of world space, bitter at the struggles that outlast, the superior illusion, welcome to the ray past. Ah, but to feel indomitably alone, that it must crouch to steel and velvet throne, maps of the world, cycle theories of the clouds, Shellian in its ignominy, inadvert de trop syntax, symphonic synopsis out the, at the outer woods. The Zeppelin stadia of the insistent echo commands insignia of pitiable anonymity, dust guest of worms, the morning sunlight on the sill, abbreviate, forgive me for my sins, as teller of earth-ridden swells and shields, synoptic arc, commander of the bells, while Heidelberg is basking in the distance, expulsions of the caliph's obelisk fold to their frigate, columns of a text, this window opens on the leaden swan of many a brisk October's waft and sway, the steepled ties cast at the outer brim of salmon fishing time in thoughts that fall like moles of dust upon each volume spine, Cascadian wishes, emolumenting fishes, three-tiered pavilion of the hierarchies. Yet still the moss thrine thrives at Buckingham Palace, St. George's Lion and the Opied Park, wrought railing west where I went down with Alice to plumb the dark Leviathan the best. The aviator in his supplicator ties his ipso octogenarian rust to Lake Luke Aquaria of Magenta Mormia, the heather denses to the sunlight's crest and scrim, pim purple, peppled pink, elected non-elective of the dyer's ink. The evening steady falls from steady grace. The sidewalk torches fiery take their place. Magnolias bear the strumpet on the wells in esteem of dandelion banjos, climbering tall grass, the sunlight busts with future memory, lyrics of the ducks, Marcel and Bonn, the Jewish Rodney here, over dry grass of Swiss decisiveness, the broken castle reappears. Lord Weir's castle, you've got to dree your Weir. George Washington, marshaled, broken. These are the books I've selected for my exile. Thank you so very much, Ben. And very congratulations on your, new, and on your new book. We look forward to seeing it. Okay, please unmute Karina Van Berklem. Karina, please share with us. Hello, can you hear me? We can, we certainly can. Hello, and thanks to all the readers. Beautiful, beautiful work today. Um, I want to read a poem um, in honor of Mark's um, new, new puppy. I want to read a poem about dogs, um, but very different kind of dogs than a sweet new puppy. Um, this is more about non-owned non dogs. Um, it's called, Who is Living Here? <clears throat> Dogs pour through the busted veins of Cusco, Peru. They are a rotting collection in little piles like an attic vase full of sun-warmed dead wasps. The first signs of life between waking fruit markets, they will later clot, exhausted in roadside heaps next to the passion fruit for sale. Sweet papaya, cheap, Plagues of dogs either wail or sleep. Thank you. 
Thank you so very much, Karina. Thank you for stopping by today. We appreciate it. Wonderful. Next, can we have publisher poet Bob Heeman? Can we unmute Bob, please? I'm unmuted. Welcome, Bob. Uh, okay, I'm going to read an information piece. There is a Hitchcock crossing the road and another boarding a bus and another leading a horse. So many Hitchcocks, each of them wearing the proper hat and the proper dark clothes, each of them never speaking in anticipation of all that is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for coming by today. We appreciate it. Jeff Cottrell. Next, we have Jeff Cottrell. Jeff, can you unmute it for us, please? Would you unmute? There we are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Let's hear it. Excellent. So here's what I like to do for new audiences. It's kind of um, an alternative to traditional love poems, because nowadays I find it it's really difficult to write a, a sincere love poem without it ending in a restraining order. So this is a poem about just liking someone. It's called Like Poem. <clears throat> Some writers say words can't express their love. Well, I don't love you. I merely like you. And surely words are good enough for that. I like you. You're kind of neat to hang out with, but only in small doses, not a lot. You're a swell opponent for a game of risk or clue or cards against humanity. I'd watch a movie with you. Nothing great, not Casablanca or The Seventh Seal, but maybe that last Hobbit film, let's say. I'd never have sex with you. Nor would I go on a long trip with you because I'd get quite sick of you after a day or two, but we know it would never come to that. Shall I compare thee to a plate of macaroni and cheese? I like mac and cheese. It's a nice lunch snack. It'll do when you just don't have time to bake. If you eat too much, you may get indigestion or dysentery or maybe even worms. That's more or less how I feel about you. How do I like thee? Let me count the ways. One, two, three. Yeah, two. That sounds about right. Two. Like me mildly, like me bland, think I'm a-okay. Say hello and shake my hand and stay six feet away. Oh, my like is not a red, red rose, but more a short, stubby dandelion, which gets chopped in the mower on a Saturday morning. Oh, my like is like a melody, but not one by Mozart or Tchaikovsky. More like a 1980s pop hit, Catchy and sweet, yet vastly disposable. Like something by Mr. Mister or Paul Young or Level 42 or DeBarge or Wang Chung. What, you don't remember them? Exactly. When a man likes a person, things still sort of carry on. He might bum a smoke or maybe lend five bucks to you. If you're bad, he'll tend to notice. And then he'll stop liking you, turn his back on you, and delete you from social media. Love means never having to say you're sorry, but like means never having to say I love you. Roses are red, violets are blue. AstroTurf is a worthy practical substitute for the real thing, and so are you. Now, actually, I don't like AstroTurf. And come to think of it, I don't like you. No, you're annoying and you smell bad too. Ah, oh, go away. Thank you, that was called Like Poem. Okay, thanks Jeff. Um, last but not least, we have Dennis Formenta. Dennis, can you unmute please? Dennis, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll take a chance and um, read an actual love, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Read an actual love poem I just uh, released from my wife, which was her birthday the other day. So let's see if this ends in a restraining order. It's called Hard Work. The voice of a barn owl 
the shadow that enters my mouth and the yellow moon, the red moon on the horizon, the moon pulled up silently on the lawn, a cross between a shadow and the back of your brain. The things you can't tell children, life's work, and it stinks unless someone else bears part of the burden. For 17 years, you have been a part of this life. Almost a quarter of my time on earth, it seems not nearly so small like I had just run four laps of the course before you caught me. Be no restraining order. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is our show. Please, once again, a big hand for our brilliant features today. Wang Pin, Rian Amakar, Scott, Leanne Brown, and Ray Armentrout. A wonderful reading from you guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Open Mic. Thank you. We, Thank appreciate you, so much. you we appreciate you too. Um, and please stop by for our translation panel next week. Helen Cardona, John Taylor, Jennifer Kwan Dobbs. It will be awesome. Please come. And Mark, do you have any last uh, words for us, Jonathan? Mark? Let's keep the love going. <laughs> Let's keep love, the love going, ladies. That's what I said. We'll keep the. All right, ladies and gentlemen, make black li lives matter. Make black lives matter. Um, stay safe, wear your masks. Thank you for coming tonight. Good night. Thanks so much. Really. Good night, everyone.